uh, let, let me just uh, very briefly outline uh, what I'm going to talk about today. So, uh, as I've mentioned to you before, we're, we're uh, roughly uh, a lecture behind, but um, uh, I will make up that ground. And today, uh, what I hope to do is to complete my discussion of politics uh, in India, uh, politics in the Indian state. Uh, and I want to remind you what the trajectory has been thus far uh, with respect to my discussion of politics. So I had been talking to you about domestic politics and the state, you know, elections, uh, the integration of India, the reorganization of Indian states, all of that. And then we had moved to a discussion uh, of uh, India and its neighbors. Uh, uh, and that brought me to the next set of questions which have to do with the nature of uh, ethnic and religious conflicts and what is called communalism. Um, so I'm going, to, I'm going to take off from where I left off and, and in the closing moments I hope to discuss uh, 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 India and its relations with uh, countries outside South Asia, that is uh, a kind of a geopolitical view of India. Uh, and, and, I, and if there's time, I would like to conclude that section, which will conclude our whole discussion of the state and politics, uh, with a brief discussion of India's changing relations with Israel uh, as an illustration uh, of how to understand uh, politics in South Asia. All right? Um, so uh, I've been speaking to you about communalism and the Indian polity. I'm not going to go through this again because I've given you a, a fairly detailed analysis of. Uh, uh, or interpretation of what we understand by communalism. Uh, but, I, but I need to give you a further elaboration of a set of ideas associated with that. Uh, and I want to take a couple of uh, instances uh, of what are described as communal conflicts in India. Uh, I'm sure that all of you have been uh, reading the news or at least watching it or uh, getting some, you know, uh, some of it from your Twitter feed or whatever you use. Uh, you've all heard about what's happened in Sri Lanka, uh, which, uh, and uh, we're actually going to take up the case of Sri Lanka uh, two weeks from now, where we're going to have a whole a week of readings uh, having to do with Sri Lanka. But uh, whether that uh, can also be viewed as an instance of communal conflict is, of course, something that we'd have to discuss when we get to that. Uh, but there's no question that, that there is an element of that uh, in Sri Lanka today. Uh, th there is, of course, a wider geopolitical context. I mean, a senior politician in Sri Lanka, I can't remember if it was the president or the prime minister, they have both, um, uh, as do some other countries, but uh, one of the two mentioned that this was clearly something that had been done in retaliation against the killing uh, of Muslims in New Zealand. Uh, but of course, uh, the person who made that claim did not advance uh, any evidence for that, and, and I think it's all too easy. Of course, if you took a larger geopolitical view, then it stands to reason that there may be some relationship uh, between the two, uh, but there are obviously other kinds of considerations uh, as well. Now, uh, when we're speaking about communalism, um, I do want to make one thing clear, uh, and then before we move to, uh, before we move to a discussion uh, of uh, instances of this communal conflict, I want to take up that article by Ashish Nandi, uh, which is really quite an extraordinary intervention into how we should try to attempt to understand uh, the relationship between culture uh, and, and uh, the state uh, in a place such as India or South Asia more widely. Uh, but we need to make a distinction between religious conflict and communal conflict, or religious conflict and communalism, because the two are really used interchangeably, and in my view that's actually rather incorrect. Uh, one way to understand it is to say that all communal conflicts are undoubtedly based in religion, but all religious conflicts do not lead to communalism. By which I mean the following, that you know, there may be, there may be someone in this room, let's say hypothetically, hypothetically who belongs to a, a religious disposition which is different from mine. Uh, I might not be a good instance because I've mentioned to you I'm, a, I'm sort of a non-believer, but let's suppose I was a Hindu or a Buddhist and there was someone who was a Christian and we had a conflict with each other uh, which was on grounds of religion. Now that's not a communal conflict because we, don't, we shouldn't assume that every person who's thinking along the lines of religion is willing to adopt the idea of religious communities, right? Because communalism involves of necessity the notion not simply that a person's religious identity predominates over all other forms of identity, as we have discussed, but rather that this religious identity becomes the basis 
for seeking community, right? So communal conflict of necessity involves the idea of one adopting a communitarian perspective. And that is not necessarily the, the case when one enters into a dispute with someone over religion, right? In other words, let's look at it this way, give you a different twist on it. We would have to understand the place of power, political power, when we're looking at the subject of communalism. Because I think that one thing we have to be clear about, that even in a, even in a country such as India, where today you have a Hindu nationalist movement, right? And, and you know, the present government has been in power for five years. Uh, we don't know how, what's going to happen at the end of this election cycle three weeks from now, uh, three, four weeks from now when they announce the results. But whatever the outcome, we know that there's a Hindu nationalist government in power. We had a similar government, maybe not a government that was so aggressively Hindu nationalist as the present government some years ago. And we have seen that the presence of this Hindu nationalist government has given encouragement to Hindu nationalists, which is why there have been instances of people belonging to other groups whether they're religious minorities or whether they're caste groups or whether they're African students who have been terrorized on the streets of India. And of course, I'm not saying it happens every day and in every city and in every town. Of course not, by no stretch of the imagination. I mean, one way to understand communalism, you read American newspaper, they'll tell you, well, the whole country is awash in religious conflict. Well, there are actually more people killed in Chicago in one American city on account of gun violence and in all of India in most years on account of religious conflict. It's as simple as that, right? So, you know, you have to keep this in perspective. I mean, there were 630 homicides in Chicago last year. And the United States has 25,000 to 30,000 homicides every year by gun, right? So, you know, if you're taking communal conflict, we, we have to understand that we're not speaking about violence erupting all the time, but it doesn't have to. You can create a culture of terror simply by having a regime in power, okay? Which is openly supporting the idea of, let's say in this case, a Hindu nation. Now, you also have Muslim communalism in India as well, not just in Pakistan, you know, which is a predominantly, overwhelmingly Muslim state, okay? But you have it in India too. You have Muslim groups who are clearly advocating, not in this case for a Muslim nation, that's not possible within India, obviously. They would be immediately dismissed and condemned and critiqued and some of them killed as fifth columnists if they were to do that. But, in, but Muslim communalism is precisely the view that, in, in the context of India, the view that the Muslim, there's a Muslim identity, this Muslim identity needs to be aggressive, they're, they're under threat so forth and so on, right? But the two are not equivalent because as, as an Indian who is not a Muslim, I have to be much more concerned about the implications of Hindu communalism, right? And so what we're saying is that there is a relationship between communalism and power, political power, who exercises power. And communalism becomes a much more potent force when we see that most subjects of a state begin to understand that the state is not neutral in some fashion. So these are different ways in which you can try to understand how religious conflicts are not necessarily communal, but all communal conflicts, as I've said, are grounded in religion. And it needs to be also understood, I mean, some, a point that I've made before, but since we are not really doing a course on British India, it's not something that I can demonstrate at any great length here, uh, although I'd be happy to do that otherwise, and I've done it in my other courses, but there's, no, but there's no question that what we find is that this religious conflict which existed in India, uh, even before the coming of the British, but you know, with the caveats that I've already supplied to you in the last several lectures, that this religious conflict is going to become considerably aggravated and exacerbated under colonial rule, beginning in the second half of the 19th century. And, and, and of course, one reason for that certainly has to do with 
again, the fact that the British understood that not simply they, that they were taking the template of their own experience, they were taking the history of religious warfare in Europe and planting it on to South Asia, so forth and so on. But I think they understood, to put it in very crude terms, the old strategy of divide and rule and how effective it can be. Right? And of course, the fundamental problem for us that we would have to really think through, and, and you'll get a better sense of that when I give you an illustration at some length, which I'm going to proceed to do in just a few minutes, of one communal conflict. Uh, but the fundamental problem for us is going to be that even if we say that the origins of communalism lie largely in British policy, that this communal tendencies became highly aggravated under the British, the indisputable fact is that India has been independent for 70 years. So what kind of life has communalism acquired in the course of the last seven decades? Has it acquired a life of its own with the passage of time? Are there Indians who really care anymore at all, whether it originated in British India, or whether it originated in 1950, or whether Hindus and Muslims have been fighting with each other for a thousand years? I mean, there's some people who are simply going to take the view that, well, frankly, we don't really care about the historical origins of this, you know? What we do understand is that our, we, we view our identities as communal, right? And so therefore, it seems to me that this is a problem that we would have to tackle no matter what kind of historical perspective we really take on the question of communalism in South Asia, right? All right, now, before I give you the examples, I want to look at a few illustrations. I want to go back to some theoretical considerations about politics. Because it's going to be too easy to simply talk about this conflict, that conflict between Hindus and Muslims, between Hindus and Sikhs, between Muslims and Sikhs, between Sunnis and Shias, so forth and so on. Right? We can, we can, we can have a laundry list of such conflicts. What Ashish Nandi does in this particular piece that was assigned to you, which is, the text is called Culture, State and the Rediscovery of Indian Politics, is he suggests that, look, there are basically two components that we have to take, keep in mind when we're looking at politics. We're, we have to take the view of culture or we can take the view of the state. All right? And I'm going to attempt to translate for you in very simple terms what Ashish Nandi is really arguing and why I think the set of arguments that he is advancing, that this set of arguments is exceedingly important to understand, not just in the case of South Asia, but if you're really seriously interested in how states tackle the question of culture, how they tackle the question of minorities. Why does the PRC, People's Republic of China, have the kind of position that it has on Tibet, right? Um, and you know, that is, Tibet is really, I mean, I think I mentioned to you that there is a substantial Tibetan population now, right? Uh, in India, the, 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 the Dalai Lama is, uh, uh, international headquarters are in Dharamshala, which is a hill station in North India. So this example is very much within, within the umbrella of our course, the one that I'm taking for a moment before, before I set to elaborate upon this in somewhat greater detail. That is a case of the PRC and China. Now, you see, you could take the view that the PRC that China has done, which is that Tibet was historically always a part of China. Uh, one of the ways, by the way, in which there are numerous ways in which you can attempt to evaluate such a claim. One of the ways in which you can evaluate that claim is you look at maps, right? How have maps shown Tibet? Has it always been shown as part of China? But then, of course, the question is, who drew the maps? Right? Because if the British drew the maps as opposed to the Chinese, well, we might have a very different perspective on historically who has Tibet really belonged to. That, that is to say, if it has belonged to someone. Right? Because of course we need to be able to advocate for another position, which is a position of autonomy for Tibet. Right? A position, for example, that I would favor, a position that, let's say, the Dalai Lama in principle would have, but he knows is a complete pipe dream, not the remotest possibility. Certainly not with an aggressive nation state such as the PRC. And one thing that needs to be said about the PRC here is that it has, of course, mastered the tools of the West. It is playing the game that the West played, and it's playing it better to the extent that it can.
than the West, which is one reason why the PRC is extremely aggressive, extremely aggressive in the kind of surveillance that it has, right? And how it monitors what its students are doing when they go to universities such as UCLA. I can tell you there's a lot of work that's been done on all of this. Right? But now if you take the question of PRC in Tibet, see fundamentally what is the argument that China is going to give? Apart from the historical argument about, well Tibet's always been a part of us, the fundamental argument it gives is that Tibet is a backward feudal territory that we needed to bring into our orbit so that we could modernize it. Because you've got all these Buddhist monks and the Lamas and they're all living in the 15th century, you know, and these people are starving, so forth and so on. They're backward. They need, they need the machinery of development to make them come into the orbit of modernity. In other words, what is culture? Because what do the Tibetans have to say for themselves? They'll say, well, hey, you know, we have our own distinct lifestyle. We have our own modes of living. We have our monasteries. You know that many of these monasteries, by the way, have been destroyed by the PRC, right? By the Chinese. But what is the argument? The, ar the argument fundamentally is that, you know, culture is not something simply that you toss around. The, the statist view is, that culture is actually disposable. It's completely disposable. Right? This is, this is th the crude way, because of course one can bring in all kinds of refinements, but this is a crude way of looking at the culturalist view and the statist view. And one of the things that Nandi is arguing is that all over the world, the statist view has triumphed without a shadow of a doubt. There are hangovers here and there. There are people here who might resist in their own particular fashion. But everywhere in the world, the idea of the European nation state was imported. This European nation state is built on the model of a statist view, obviously, that the state will command everything, including the culture. The culture's resources are at the goodwill of the state, so to speak. Right? That's the statist view. And the statist view here, it, so what he's saying, Nandi is saying that you have, you have these two components. This, in the statist view, the state assumes the critical role, eliminates that part of the culture which is seen as backward, feudal, and therefore, of course, all of these states are engaged in projects of social and cultural engineering. Okay? Now the social and cultural engineering can be described in various ways. And what I mean by social and cultural engineering means that we have to understand that this view, the status view is that there is a proper nation state. There is a model for a proper nation state. And this proper nation state must have proper subjects. Okay, what, are the, what is one of the problems with India from the status point of view? That the Indians are this anarchic lot who, who cannot easily be accommodated to the state is you. You have to keep on working on them. You have to make them pliant. You have to make them understand the protocols of the state, so forth and so on. All right? Now, let me give you a very different illustration of what I mean. Okay? Every nation state has something called a national anthem. I think you would agree with me. I don't know of a country in the world that doesn't have a national anthem. Generally, the national anthem is in what is called the national language, generally. I mean, you're not going to have the United States have its national anthem in Ukrainian, okay, or Greek, or Swahili. It's going to be in English. The national anthem of France is going to be in French. There's a national anthem. And one of the things the national anthem is meant to do is to what? It's meant to make you into a proper subject. And to make you a compliant, loyal, obedient servant of the state. Right? It's meant to provoke pride in you. Right? Which is why at, you know, Dodgers baseball game or something like that before the game, you know, you all do the national anthem. Or, you know, high school graduation, national anthem. 
Yeah, because, because these are rites of passage of a nation. Right? That's what they are. They're rites of passage of a nation. Just as there are rites of passage in an individual's life. Now, here's the anomaly. India does have a national anthem, but I can give you a hundred percent assurance that it is not the song that everyone loves and adores. First thing is, the national anthem is called Janagana Mana. That's the first three words of it. it originally composed as Bharto Bhagyo Vidata. It is in Shadu Bangla. Shadu means pure. Bengali. Bengali is a language spoken in Eastern India. It is not in Hindi. It is not in Hindi. It's composed by Rabindranath Tagore, who also, by the way, has a distinction of having composed a song that would become the national anthem of Bangladesh. Amar Shonar Bangla. You know, our golden Bengal. Right? So he's, he's, the, he's the composer of the national anthems of two countries. But remember that the national anthem is not in Hindi. It spoke, it's in Beng Bengali and it's not even colloquial Bengali. It's a highly Sanskritized Bengali, which means it's very difficult. You know, if you, if you, if you, if you picked 10 people from the street in India randomly and said, what does a national anthem mean? Completely clueless. Because it's virtually indecipherable to most people. Now there is a second song called Sare Jahan Se Acha Hindustan Hamara. Better than all other nations is this land of ours called Hindustan. But guess what? The person who composed that went on to become the national poet of Pakistan. His name is Sir Muhammad Iqbal. And this song was composed by him in Urdu, which is a language always associated with Muslims by the Hindus in India. Sare Jahan Se Acha Hindustan Amara. You know, you can see one of the films you're going to see, week nine, when we do the segment having to do with popular Indian cinema, a film called Divar. And you'll hear little segments of this Sare Jahan Se Acha. And you'll see why it is a song that is played everywhere. And then there is a third song which also competes for the designation of national anthem. So there is, so you know what they did was when they had the national anthem, they understood that frankly no one really knew it. It wasn't that popular. So they, they made a distinction between national anthem and national song. So officially, Vande Matram is the national song. And Janaganamana is the national anthem. And this Vande Matram is a composition once again in Bengali. Bande Madra means hail the motherland. And it is composed by a man called Bankim Chandra Chatterjee. Now, you see, this is exactly what I love about this part of the world and what the Hindu nationalists absolutely hate. Why? Because they say, what kind of country is this? Right? We have a national anthem that no one knows. It's in, it's in Sanskritic Bengali, which a minuscule portion of the population knows. Right? Why cannot we not have one national anthem instead of having three songs effectively? A national anthem that is going to be in Hindi, which is the most widely spoken language. But what I'm suggesting to you is, so that is the statist view. Because they see the national anthem purely instrumentally. That hey, you know, whenever there's going to be a major event, and you have to have the national anthem, you know, Everyone stands up, everyone knows what it is. Doesn't matter whether you're from Orissa, from Bengal, from Tamil Nadu, from Kashmir, from Delhi, whatever the case might be, it should have the consent of everyone. And my question to you is, why? Why should it? Right? Why should we have a very homogenous conception? Why should culture be hijacked by the state? That is essentially what Nandi is talking about. That if you're going to try to understand the problems of South Asia, we have to understand how the relations between culture and the state began to shift, particularly after independence, and particularly, of course, in the course of the last several decades.
when modernizing elites began to take the view of the state, which was the view of the state that you found all, all over the West. All right, that's the fundamental argument. Uh, I won't be able to take any questions right now if you have any, because there's a lot of territory that I have to cover today. But I want you to keep that in mind when we start thinking now about some further considerations. So I was talking to you about communalism. And you'll see how we can bring Nandi back into, into the question here. And I want to look at a couple of instances of what are called communal conflict. Um, I want to look at, um, I'm not going to look at the, 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 the anti-Sikh uh, program in great detail, but I will talk about it for five, ten minutes. And, and I want to look in, in much more great, greater detail at the conflict that arose over a mosque uh, in the North Indian city of Ayodhya. Uh, the conflict started uh, uh, in the 1990s. Uh, and finally, uh, if I may put it, there's no, there's no finality to it because, because the site is still under dispute. But the particular mosque that stood there since the 16th century was destroyed by Hindu militants um, on 6th December 1992. Uh, and you know, there have been other instances where there have been killings of Muslims, um, most notably in Gujarat in 2002. I mentioned that because a person who was then the chief minister of Gujarat, um, Narendra Modi, uh, subsequently went on to become the prime minister of India. He's, he's been the prime minister of India for the last five years. Um, so obviously that tells you something about the fact that a person under whose watch uh, over a thousand Muslims were killed, and that this person then goes on to become the, the prime minister. All right, and then there are of course instances of Sikh Muslim conflict, uh, most notably going back to the partition of 1947, uh, instances of Sunni Shia conflicts, such as for example in Pakistan down to the present day. All right, let's look at the dispute called the dispute over what is the mosque in Ayodhya, known as the Babri Masjid, uh, the Hindu, Hindu extremists. Sometimes I might use a phrase, if I use a phrase, I've only slipped into it, Hindu fundamentalist, because frankly, I don't like the word fundamentalism in this context. It's, it's an idea that really goes back to Protestant Christianity uh, and the beginnings of fundamentalism in the United States. So you know, I really mean Hindu extremists, uh, Hindu uh, nationalists. Um, they call it the Ram Janam Stan. Um, uh, and this is a dispute that, as I said, goes back really to the 1990s. I mean, there are shades of this dispute, perhaps going back several decades before that as well. But it really takes on a life of its own beginning in the 1990s. And then finally, it leads to the destruction, destruction of the mosque, as I said. So what is the dispute about? All right. So there's a mosque that was built in 1526 called the Babri Masjid. Masjid means mosque. Um, said to have been built at the orders of Mughal Emperor Babur in Ayodhya. Uh, even, even, even some of those details are, by the way, contested, but I'm taking the general view of the matter without getting into all the particularities. Okay? And Ayodhya is, as I've said, a city in North India uh, with thousands of temples. Important to note that. right? So what is Ayodhya? Ayodhya is a city that is associated with Ram. So Ram is a Hindu deity. Right? He's also one of the incarnations of Vishnu, um, uh, the god Vishnu, and he is the principal character in that great epic known as the Ramayana. Right? Now, to really cut to the chase, in the 1990s, okay, a little before that, Going back to the 1980s, mid-1980s, Hindu nationalists began to argue. Now, there are shades of this argument going back 40, 50 years ago, but nothing ever transpired. Right? And, and that's what I mean when I say that I'm really giving you the gist of it, because we cannot get bogged down by all the details, which are enormous. But in the mid-1980s, the Hindu nationalists began to argue that this mosque was built by destroying a Hindu temple that had stood on that exact spot. And then if you're like myself, you might say to yourself, let's supposing you heard only this much and nothing else. You might say, all right, so what? Right? I mean, they've been... The city has thousands of temples, 
that whole area has thousands of temples. So one, one temple was destroyed by the Muslims. Not that I condone the destroying of religious monuments. Let me be very clear, lest someone should say, ah, well, you know, no, no. I'm just saying that actually, frankly, by the way, that is not uncommon in history, and it's not simply Hindus and Muslims. There's a history of this. But if you're looking at, if you're looking at a very good illustration of the history of that in Christianity and Islam, for example, right? If you're looking, if you've be, ever been to Istanbul, so you look at the Santa Sophia and what its history is. That it goes from the Muslim to the Christians, from the Christians back to the Muslims, back and forth. Right? And you know, there's a word in English which we seldom use. It's called spoliage. This is a history of spoliage. It's very often you actually even build a religious monument with the rubble of the previous monument. However, the Hindu nationalist view is a little bit more particular. Because offensive as it might be to destroy a temple and then build a mosque, and of course if indeed that happened, and I haven't said yes, yet, yet that it happened. I'm saying this is their claim. This is their claim. There are historians who have argued otherwise. If you've read my chapter that was assigned to you from my book, The History of History, you know that I revisit this whole terrain and I talk about what are the different arguments that the historians have given about what really happened you know, in Ayodhya. All right? But this is the claim. Let's just go with the claim first. Right? Now here is the particularity of the claim that we have to think about. The argument is that this wasn't just any temple. That the temple that they destroyed, that is the Muslims who built a mosque, this temple was destroyed because this very spot where that temple stood was a spot where Ram was born. And then you get some astrologer or someone who looks at his astrological tables and says, ah, you know, Ram was born in the year 7,729 7, BCE at 428 AM. You know, some nonsense, right? Now, guess what? I mean, the first question is, since when did Hindus start historicizing Ram? That is it. What's happening here? What's happening here is, that many of these Hindus are saying, hey, if you look at Islam, if you look at Christianity, these are religions with historical founders. What do you get in Hinduism instead? What you get is no idea when this religion originated. Its origins are completely shrouded in mystery, so to speak. Right? There is no historical founder. I think that's a jolly good thing, that there is no historical founder. What's the problem? That's what I'm trying to understand. I'm trying to enter into the minds of these Hindu nationalists as saying, why do they want to turn Hinduism into Islam? I thought, that, I thought you guys despise Islam. Then why do you want to turn your religion into a religion like Islam? Why do you want your Ram to be like Muhammad? So that now we have a historical founder, and then we can say, ah, this historical founder got these revelations, which are called the Quran, in the case of Islam, right? You know that the revelations took place over many years. They didn't, they didn't just come overnight uh, to the Prophet. You know, there are different phases of it. There are the Mecca verses, there are the Medina verses. They're quite different. That's a different story. But the point is that Ram was never a historical figure. And if he was, no Hindu was ever animated enough to do anything about it. Right? That's what I'm trying to suggest to you. We, that these Hindu nationalists have now become obsessed with transforming Hinduism into a religion of history. That is not the nature of that religion. Because this, they were working with the supposition which goes back to colonial times. That if you're going to have a faith, it has to be a rational faith. This is of course an argument that this is too complicated an argument really. I'm not going to expect you to really follow the whole argument here. But this is precisely what many, many people have been working on. How nearly every religion in the world 
got shaped and transformed by Protestant Christianity, which was seen as the model for what is called a religion. And so what these Hindu social reformers started to do in the 19th century was starting to transform Hinduism so that it starts to look like Protestant Christianity. Let's have a holy book. You know, a holy book. Well, why do you need a holy book? Why, why do you need it? If you have it, fine. I don't have a problem. But if those who don't have it, why should they have one? Right? Why should there be one historical founder? Why should there be one God? That's the question that really arises. So what did these Hindu nationalists want to do? They said, ah, this mosque stands there as an eternal reminder to us Hindus of our humiliation. A Muslim conqueror came in the 16th century, destroyed a temple that was there, so now this mosque should be destroyed. Quid pro quo. Right? That's, that's fundamentally the argument. That somehow this is going to be a restoration of our pride. And so I think one of the things that I would like to alert you to, and of course this is my reading, I, there are a good many historians who are friends of mine who don't agree with this reading at all. But this is the problem of history. This is what happens when you start historicizing, particularly a religion such as Hinduism. Because what happened here? That the historians came into the into the conflict. It was a very interesting illustration for those of your history majors and you're ever wondering whether anyone ever takes note of historians at all, you know, unless you write another Pulitzer Prize winning biography of George Washington, we've had 50 already, maybe another 50, you know, or Lincoln or the Civil War, right? I mean, who takes note of historians? I mean, they're a drop in the ocean, right? But here, the interesting thing was what? Suddenly, the historians were prominently on all the first pages. Because they, the question was, was there a, a temple there or not? What do the historians have to say? What does the archaeological evidence have to say? Right? And of course, my submission to you, this is where my reading is different, is you cannot resolve these disputes on the basis of historical evidence. You cannot. If you, if you think that most people are simply going to be persuaded by the archaeological or historical evidence, then I don't think one has an understanding of how the public sphere actually works. You know, It's like the so-called base of Mr. Trump. You could produce any fact and would have the, no consequence at all for them. None whatsoever. That has been demonstrated repeatedly, repeatedly. And there are these liberals who are still holding out some hope you know, where enlightenment will come to this group of people, as it were. But that's not how things work. And so what's interesting here is these historians battling it out. Yes, there was, there wasn't. And then, of course, some people on the left saying, ah, but you know, look, even if there was, well, the fact of the matter is that the Hindus destroyed Buddhist stupas, right? And the Buddhists destroyed Jaina temples. Well, you know, then it's an endless cycle. This will go on ad infinitum. And so this is why we, this is what I mean, that when you bring history into the domain, in that part of the world, you actually create more problems rather than resolving them. Because the interesting thing, and the evidence in my view is incontrovertible, is number one, the communal conflicts in India are largely urban. Number two, the educated are more communalized than the non-educated. This is not an argument for not being educated, please. I'm, I'm not making that argument. But I'm also suggesting to you that this is another great liberal view. Ah, you know, Education will resolve all the problems. No, not even remotely. We have seen that the educated in India are much more likely to support Hindu nationalism than those who come from the villages. And I think that this dispute showed very well what happened. So if you run through this, right, 
the, the Ram Janam Stan means birthplace. Ram Janam is birth, Stan is place. The same same suffix you find as in Pakistan, Uzbekistan, Stan is place. So Ram Janam Stan is the place where Ram was born. That settled me this idea that, well, we can actually pinpoint the exact place where Ram was born and the exact time. You know, this, this became part of the, the Hindu claim. Now, let me, let me go back a little bit. Because one of the interesting questions is, and again, we can't do full justice to the subject for the obvious reason that it's a long, complicated subject. But how did Hindu nationalism suddenly arise? Or was it sudden at all? And of course, the history of this goes back to the late 19th century. I mean, you were, for those of you who were here during the clips that were shown by Anand Patwardhan, uh, you know that, this, that, that the Hindu Mahasabha and the RSS, these are organizations that are founded in the 1920s, 1930s, early 1930s. These are organizations that began to take the view that the Congress, which was a major nationalist organization, did not really speak you know, for a Hindu nation. And they were interested in the idea of a Hindu nation because, and one of the things you have to remember, that many of these Hindu nationalists back then and down, down to the present day take the view that, look, this is our only solace because we, unlike Muslims, are not all scattered all over the world. Unlike Christians, we're not scattered all over the world. That Hinduism historically is the religion of this part of the world. Yes, of course, now there are Hindus in the U.S., part of the diaspora, and in Kenya, and so forth and so on. But this is all 19th century, 20th century, right? Whereas Islam, of course, we know spread over the world. You know, that within, within, within a decade of the death of Muhammad, Islam had begun to spread. Now we know that it comes to India, west, west coast of India, 740 approximately. We know that the Islamic conquests of large parts of Europe took place quite rapidly, so forth and so on. And Christianity, of course, was a worldwide religion. Buddhism spread from India to Southeast Asia to China, Japan, all of that. The Hindus have long held to the view that this is really the only place we have. And we want to keep it Hindu. Right? This, this has always been part of what has an animated the Hindu nationalist imagination going back to the 20s, early 1930s. All right? Now, when Mahatma Gandhi was assassinated, and I think this was shown in the clips that you saw, I might have mentioned it, but the RSS, which is a Rashtriya Swayam Sevak Sangh, which is one of the major Hindu nationalist organizations. The Prime Minister Modi is a lifelong member, by the way, of the RSS, uh, as, is the, as is the Interior Minister, um, um, minister, uh, minister of Home um, uh, in India, a lifelong member of the RSS. The RSS was banned after the assassination of Gandhi. And it was banned because the government of India took the view that the RSS had promoted r religious hatred for Muslims, right? and, that, and that, that they had spread a kind of a poison. The word poison is used by people like Jawaharlal Nehru and Sadar Patel when they are discussing you know, the assassination of Mahatma Gandhi and its aftermath. So the RSS was banned and what happened was that the RSS sort of went into a wilderness. And then in the mid-1970s, you know, ban is lifted, by the way, after a year and a half. So it's not the ban is not very long. But, but I can tell you that throughout the 1950s, the RSS was basically an organization that was, I wouldn't say in hiding, but it was not an organization that had any kind of prominent public presence, partially because the backlash against the RSS after the assassination of Gandhi was quite strong uh, in the public imagination as well. Right? Uh, and then owing to a dent of circumstances, you're going to see the, the emergence of the Hindu right. They're going to start to slowly come out of um, the wilderness uh, beginning in the 1970s. Uh, and then uh, you're going to see the rise of what is called the Bharatiya Janta Party. The Bharatiya Janta Party, which is the dominant political party uh, of which Narendra Modi is the head, uh, you know, in the last election, uh, 2014, uh, they won 300 60 some odd seats, I forget the exact number, I think it was 365 or something of that kind. Um, 20 years ago, when they fought the elections, they won two seats. Two seats. Right? So you just imagine, right? Where you win two seats in the entire parliament and then 
20, 25 years later, you win 365 seats and get an absolute majority. Yes? Those seats have, but did most of them want the um, INC? Sorry? Uh, but the, the seats that flipped, did most of them before belong to the Congress? Oh, yeah, yeah, Congress, yeah, yeah. What? The Congress was the dominant party, but the Congress is going to start. And there are going to be lots of reasons for that, some of which we will be able to understand when we, when we continue with this and when we start to look at the Sikh. Um, uh, uh, the, the case of the Sikhs and Sikh secessionism in India uh, in uh, the late 1970s, leading to the assassination of Mrs. Gandhi in 1984. Okay? Um, and I want to conclude this section with just a very slight observation that, you know, there are sometimes there are things which cannot be explained by the dominant paradigm. That is that when you're looking at the position, because of course the obvious question that arises is, well, what is the position of Muslims in, you know, uh, in, in India today? Are they being demonized as they're being demonized in some other countries, for example? All right? And I think that there's one or two things I want you to take note of. The first is simply an observation that I would want you to kind of reflect on and try to see what sense you can make of that. See, if you look at Muslims worldwide, what is extraordinarily interesting is that these Muslims either live in Muslim majority countries, that is countries that are overwhelmingly Muslim, okay, which would be most of the countries of the Middle East, Indonesia, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Bangladesh, Malaysia, and so on. Or you get Muslims who are a very small minority, as in the United States. You know, you could say that the Muslims constitute, I haven't seen the census figures, but you could say, let's say approximately 1% of the population. Okay? Or the United Kingdom, where the percentage would be slightly larger. Right? France, Germany, and by the way, that's all very recent. Right? France, Germany, France, its Muslims are mainly from North Africa, you know, right? Germany, mainly Turks, for example. But these are all recent populations, relatively recent populations. Their percentage of the population is very small. India is an anomaly in this picture. Because it is not predominantly Muslim, but it does not have a small, insignificant Muslim population. Numerically, of course, it's one of the largest Muslim populations in the world. Uh, right? right after Indonesia, you get Pakistan and India. You know, roughly about 180, 190, 200 million. Right? But, but if you're looking at the percentage, it's 14% of the total population. And one of the things to reflect on there is the fact that if you're looking at Hindu communalism and you're trying to understand, well, what is the position of Muslim there, I'm trying to suggest to you that, well, for one thing, India itself presents an anomaly if you're looking at the Muslim world in several respects. It also presents an anomaly because here you're talking about a place where Hindus and Muslims have inhabited that same space for over 1,000 years. Over 1,000 years. Right? So we would have to have a different understanding of the place of the Muslim in the Indian polity. And what's also important is that there are other factors here which we would have to look at. For example, there was a report published by the government of India, it's headed by a man called Justice Sanchar. That's why it's called the Sanchar Committee Report. Uh, committee reports are usually named after, like the Mueller report, right? Usually named after the person who wrote it or who's the chair, if it's a committee. Uh, and what this report basically shows is that Muslims, even though they are integrated in some respects into Indian society, that they do not fare well when we look at all the different indices of development. So when we say indices of development, what would be one good illustration? What percentage of higher degrees in India are earned by Muslims? And then if you say what percentage of those higher degrees, whether they be bachelor degrees or masters or, or doctorates, what percentage of those degrees earned by Muslims are earned by Muslims in non-Muslim educational institutions? 
You see, it's, it, the, the comparable thing in the United States would be what? Looking at what percentage of degrees are earned by African Americans. And then saying, ah, and what percentage of these are actually earned by African Americans in what are not historically black colleges? You know, there's a whole category of institutions called historically black colleges. And there are dozens of them, right? You know, for example, in, in UCLA, I don't know how many of you know what percentage of the student body is African American because it is nowhere near their percentage in the population. It's three percent of the student body. Right? So, if you if you had a, a comparable report for the United States, you'd say, well, now this is an index of development quote, right? And this is the problem that we have. Right? Now, one thing that you'd have to know in order to evaluate this. Because then you could say, ah, this is a failure of the state in India post-1947. You could say that. And you would be perfectly justified in saying that. But here's a complication. And that complication is that if you read the historical record, you find that this problem goes back to well before India became independent. So there's a book p published by Peter Hardy called The Muslims of British India, Cambridge University Press, 1972. Right? Now, what does he argue? What he argues is, ah, if you look at the Muslims of British India, let's say 1900, random date, 1900, for every 50 Hindus who are earning a bachelor's degree, one Muslim is earning a bachelor's degree. But their percentage of the population is 25%. That's undivided India, right? So you see, we would, have, we would then have to say, well, are these, are these, some of these problems go back to the 19th century. The Indian state has not alleviated these problems or not done enough to alleviate these problems. There's some degree of insecurity that is experienced by the Muslims. This insecurity is being further aggravated by the fact that they are not fully integrated in some respects, right? But again, the question of integration, because, and, and, and I, I want to bring that in here, is very important because there is a different way you can look at it. And, and with that, I'll conclude this segment over here. What is that illustration? If you are looking, okay, and I'm using this as a sake of convenience, these terms, because I have some reservations about these terms. But if you're looking at the recruitment of jihadis, right? So for example, how many people were recruited into ISIS or Al-Qaeda. Every report points out that it has been almost impossible to recruit Muslims from India. There are a lot more Muslims that have been recruited from Great Britain than from India into organizations such as Al-Qaeda and ISIS. Right. And that suggests a very different picture. What it suggests is that well, of course, you might say that, well, these Muslims aren't easily seduced by this narrative and they're not seduced because they're worried about what happens if they go here and what the repercussions might be for their, might be for their family back in India. Of course, that's a consideration that could apply to a Muslim anywhere, you know, if you're being recruited and, you know, you join, you join ISIS or Al-Qaeda or whatever organization there might be, right? What it rather suggests is that when we are trying to understand the Muslim in India, we would have to have a view that would go beyond all the traditional categories, education, you know, integration into civil service jobs, so forth and so on. That there may be some, some ways in which, yeah, I'll take one question, and some ways in which, in which you could say that the Muslim actually does feel integrated. Yes? that went to Pakistan. Yeah. Well, you're talking, you're, are, you talking about, are you talking about Indian Muslims taking part in the insurrections in Kashmir? Is that what you're referring to? Uh, for the ah, what percentage? What's the question exactly? Uh, what percentage or what level of recruitment to the Hadith organizations were taking place by uh, Muslims that relocated across the partition into 
No, no. But you see, the, the, the concept of jihadis as it is used today doesn't go back to 1947. This, the, the, when you're looking at the global discourse of what are called jih the jihadi movements, this is basically two, three decades old. Well, partition is 19, 1947. Right? So you, you understand what I'm saying, right? Yeah. That, when, and that, and that when you're speaking about recruitment to ISIS, Al-Qaeda, that's why I gave those two organizations as illustrations. These are organizations that date back to two decades. Two decades, three decades at most. ISIS, of course, even not even two decades. Uh, Al-Qaeda would go back to about two, two and a half decades, you know. Right? So, so the question wouldn't have any j relevance to the question of how one would look at partition in 1947, you know. Yeah, okay? All right. Now, let me move to an illustration of a different kind. Um, and this is not Hindu Muslim. So this is, by the way, you'll have some slides here which will be made available to you. I will post these PowerPoint slides um, uh, at the end of this week, everything that we have done uh, thus far, okay? And this is a slide which shows the destruction. It was actually literally destroyed by the hand. You had 10,000 Hindu militants who just clambered onto these mosque these are the domes of the mosque and literally went with axes and hammers and you know shovels and just destroyed it and reduced it to rubble okay um, Sikhs let me first begin with <coughs> a brute fact and then we have to try to understand what led to that 1984 Summer of 1984, June, the Golden Temple in Amritsar, which is considered the holiest of the shrines that the Sikhs has, is going to be attacked by the Indian Armed Forces. It's going to be attacked by the Indian Armed Forces, and it's going to be, this is the Golden Temple, set in the middle of a, 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 a small lake. Um, and... Uh, you know, there are other holy shrines, but this is, if you had to put it this way, the Sanctum Sanctorum for the Sikhs. All right? Um, this is, a, a, again, a rendering. This is a, actually a poster. It's a kind of poster, by the way. When you're doing the history of contemporary South Asia, these are things that you have to know as well. It's a kind of poster that you can go to the Golden Temple and you can buy it outside for 20 cents. It shows the 10 great gurus of the Sikh faith over here on the top. So the Sikh faith has had 10 gurus or teachers. Um, and this language here is Gurmukhi, okay? Um, and uh, there is a question about, uh, but we'll get into that in much greater detail, uh, to what extent Sikhism uh, is a completely distinct religion, to what extent are there overlaps, particularly with, with Hinduism. Uh, this is a photograph uh, of the temple, the golden temple. Um, inside the temple, it was basically, basically an arsenal. Uh, that's one of the reasons why the, go, the Indian army moved into the temple, because the Sikh secessionists, and I'm going to give you a little bit account of that, the Sikh secessionists had basically holed up inside here, and when the Indian army launched an assault on this temple, uh, they recovered, you know, uh, grenades, guns, explosives. Uh, this image is, by the way, from the Sikh museum itself, okay? Um, and this is what the Golden Temple, one of the buildings of the Golden Temple looked like uh, after the attack by the Indian Temple, all right? Um, so let us go back to the nature of the conflict. Uh, once again, uh, uh, apologies for the simplification, but uh, because, you know, I, I, could I could talk about this for 10 hours. I could give you the full-blown account, which would require an understanding of what exactly really is at stake. But I have to try to condense it for you. So Sikhism uh, is uh, a religion which, um, you know, let's say for the sake of convenience, uh, as I've told you before in India, it's nice to round up things to 500, 400,000, you know, let's say 500 years old. All right, uh, Nanak, uh, Guru Nanak, uh, is the person who is viewed as a founder of the faith, uh, and he is a, an itinerant preacher, itinerant religious preacher. Uh, his verses, his compositions, suggest that Hindus and Muslims uh, were people who viewed themselves as distinct in some fashion, and yet, of course, as his own compositions will suggest, there was also a culture of syncretism in South Asia at that time. 
All right. Um, so there are, uh, you know, uh, what he's uh, what he is doing can best be understood if you look at uh, a fellow poet of his, uh, who is a little bit before his time, a man by the name of Kabir, and. One of the things that Kabir talks about in his poem, so Kabir is 1389 to about 1465, approximate dates. Uh, one of the things that Kabir talks about is he says that, you know, what's the difference between Hindus and Muslims? Hindus are not circumcised, Muslims are circumcised. The Hindus have their Vedas, the Muslims have their Quran. Right? But at the end of the day, how is that important? How is that important? Of course, you could say that that was the naive, a naive view. Uh, just how important it is to some people can be demonstrated by the fact that in 1947, when the partition of India took place, you know that you can't really distinguish between a Hindu and a Muslim, right? So how did you? How did they actually distinguish when the killings? So you're crossing the border or trying to cross the border, and there's a bunch of people after you. And depending on whether you were a Hindu or a Muslim, you would either be saved or slaughtered. Well, how did they actually distinguish between the men? They asked the men to lower down their pants. And if you were circumcised, you were either saved or killed. As simple as that. There is a wonderful film, which you should see, a beautiful film called Mr. and Mrs. Iyer, which is a bunch of people taking a, a trip on a bus in India. And there's a scene which enacts pretty much this. Okay? It's set in contemporary India, not set at the time of partition of 1947. Okay? So now, Guru Nanak is operating at a time when you obviously, and particularly in North India, there had been a Muslim presence now, now for centuries. And so what he is going to do is, he is, and you know, this is a life story of every religious figure, right? There's a hagiography. There's always some divine sign of inspiration, whether it's a life of Christ or the Buddha, always. You know, if there wasn't one, you'd have to make it up, because otherwise, how do you determine the religiosity of a great figure? That's just par for the course. You have to have some sign some divine sign there. And so there are all these stories about Guru Nanak, that he spoke in tongues as it were, something like that. Okay? Uh, the wise people couldn't understand him. Even when he was a little boy, he was speaking in riddles and this and that, that sort of thing. All right? Now, but what he's doing is he is going to try to create a kind of a syncretic faith, where there are elements taken from Islam. So, you know, Sikhs, Sikhs view themselves as monotheistic, to use a category that, as I said, is really not a category used in India, but for the sake of convenience, they view themselves as monotheistic. Um, their holy book has verses from lots of different writers. Okay? Um, uh, and most importantly, Throughout the 19th century, it was almost impossible to distinguish Hindu and Sikh practices. Every colonial writer would remark on that. You know? In the Punjab, which is the historic homeland of the Sikhs, Western India, remember the part, Punjab was partitioned, right? The partition that took place in the West. In the Punjab, it was very common through the 1960s and 70s, I'm not talking about 200 years ago, that if two children were born in a Hindu household, the first would be raised as a Hindu, the second as a Sikh. The first would be given a Hindu name, the second a Sikh name. Not uncommon at all. All right? And there is a person, a scholar, who's at UBC, University of British Columbia. His name is Harjot Obroy. He wrote a book called The Construction of Religious Boundaries. And this book is a very detailed discussion of precisely the fact that you could not actually distinguish, for the most part, in the 19th century, between a Hindu and a Sikh. And that there were many Hindus and Sikhs who themselves were not interested in distinguishing. The colonial state starts to get worried about it because they, they, they do not understand the nature of multi-religious entities. 
multi-religious communities. They do not understand the idea that a person might have multiple religious identities. You know? And that's one of the things that a census does, right? What does a census do historically? The census actually produces a certain kind of identity. You know, you get the, the census form, 1800, 41, 1841, 1871, 1901, check one box. And you know what happens, which religion you are. Hindu, Muslim, Buddhist, Sikh, Christian. And if you check three, you know what happens, right? The form comes back. Now, there's a mistake. You can't be all three or two. You have to be one. It's the same thing with gender. Now, of course, supposedly in our wisdom today, we are becoming enlightened about transgender and this and that. And you can have, you know, you don't have to be just male or female. Right? But all of these questions are, are questions that have been there for a long time. So this is the context that we're really talking about. And this is, this is where I bring in census enumerations. What does a census say? And it's precisely this idea that, ah, you have to define yourself properly. You know, okay? So now the question is, what are the roots of Sikh separatism? Because when the, when the Golden Temple is a sacred shrine of the Sikhs, as it were, the Indian army moves into it. And let me give you the aftermath of that, and then we go back, right? Which is that five months after this happened, the Prime Minister of India, who had ordered the assault on the Golden Temple, Mrs. Indira Gandhi, the daughter of Jawaharlal Nehru, the first Prime Minister, who died in 1964, Mrs. Indira Gandhi is going to be assassinated by her own bodyguards who are Sikhs. In fact, she had been advised by her advisors after the assault on the Golden Temple that, look, there are some Sikhs who are, who are obviously furious at the assault on their sacred shrine, and that it's probably in your best interest not to have Sikh bodyguards. And to her credit, I must say, I don't have too much admiration for most of these politicians, but on this note, I do. To her credit, I must say that she's, her response was, well, this is a secular polity. I, I, you know, it's not possible for me in this instance to say that, ah, merely because they're Sikhs, right, therefore I cannot have them as a bodyguard. I, I think Mr. Trump should have only Muslim bodyguards, frankly, <laughs> personally, that's my view. Only Muslims. I, I, I think the entire pre presidential secret service attached to him, whether it's 500 or 1,000 people, I think it should be only Muslims. And then we'll see the real test of a democracy at work. Okay? And that's, so she's going to be shot dead by her Sikh bodyguards. That's the aftermath. What was this all about? What was this, this was all about was 1947, the partition of India takes place. I mentioned to you in passing, the Sikhs take the view that, well, in a sense, we've gotten the worst of it. The Muslims got their homeland. We don't have a homeland. Our historic homeland, in fact, has been split, has been partitioned. Many of the Sikh sacred sites are in Pakistan now. There's many in India, but they're divided. Right? And the vast majority of the Sikhs, of course, live in India, apart from those who have now moved on to the diaspora such as the United States, Canada is a huge Sikh population, Britain. Okay, so now there is going to be a demand for autonomy. You have to distinguish autonomy from homeland because some Sikhs are going to demand a homeland. Some are, only, some are going to demand autonomy by which they mean a diminution of central powers Remember the relation between the centers and the states that I've spoken to you about. That the center shall have less interference in matters that a state can adjudicate on its own. So they, they basically want greater autonomy. They want a status for Punjabi language. They want a state of their own. Punjab was the historic homeland. It had been partitioned. But of course, post-47, moving into the 50s and 60s, you have a large population of Hindus as well. They want basically a homeland. Some people are going to argue for greater autonomy within the federal, within the Union of India. Some are going to argue for a separate country. This separate country is going to be called Khalistan. 
There are some Khalistani advocates who pretend that this state actually came into existence. If you look at this over here, Khalistan, the no new global reality. No, no, there is no reality here. It, it's all fiction, complete fiction. You know, forget about a nice PowerPoint presentation by someone, flags, including the flag of Khalistan. Well, yeah, you can, anyone can come up with a flag. You know, I can create a flag of my own. Khalistan's national bird, right? The hawk. Uh, I mean, in India, the quip is the national bird is tandoori chicken of Khalistan, but we won't get into that one. Yeah? So, you see what's happening here. Number one, ah, this desire to create a nation state. I mean, this is the ultimate fantasy that everyone has. People who don't have a nation state want this miserable thing called a nation state. You know? I mean, what do the Kurds want? They want their nation state. Right? What are you going to do with a nation state? Right? Why, don't, why can't we all live in multi-religious, multi-ethnic polities maybe? But that's, uh, you know, a big question. Right? The question here is, they wanted a state. And they started producing passports. Literally, passports. You know, Republic of Khalistan. Well, try entering the United States with a passport called the Republic of Khalistan, you know, or any other country for that matter. Because that's how you designate a nation state, right? You, you have this document called a passport, which, if you didn't know, is a relatively recent modern recent, relatively recent invention, goes back to about 1900. Read a book called The Social History of the Passport and you'll see exactly when the passport arose. People didn't travel with passports 300 years ago. You know, the people who came to Ellis Island weren't flashing something called a passport, you know. Right, important. How these things shape. So, the, the, so the, 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 what this is about is a secessionist movement is going to arise. It's going to become very violent. And what should be noted is that these Sikh secessionists, terrorists the Indian state called them, of course, because they were creating mayhem from the point of view of the Indian state. right? And were there legitimate demands or not? Again, a complicated set of questions. I think there were some demands that were entirely legitimate. But there was also, of course, what the Khalistanis, that is the advocates, were, were doing. If you look at the orchestrated set of assaults, assassinations, okay, bomb attacks. I, I mean, I remember growing up in, you know, in, in being in Delhi in my 20s at that time, and I remember that you had to always, when you boarded a public bus, the first thing, look underneath the seat to see if somebody strapped a bomb. Because there were buses exploding. People getting killed. Many of the people who were killed were moderate Sikhs. So you see, the common assumption is they targeted the Hindus. Not entirely. In fact, they, mod they targeted moderate Sikhs in part because the idea was that these moderate Sikhs are betraying the true elements of their faith. So, how, so what's the difference between a moderate Sikh and an orthodox Sikh who belongs to the Khalistan movement? A moderate Sikh, for example, shaves his beard. Right? Because again, it goes back to the symbols. Remember the circumcision of the male. Now it goes back to the symbols. How do you distinguish between the two? Huh? So what's going to happen is a secessionist movement and what the Indian state is going to do, this is unfortunately what the, the only way that nation states know how to respond by and large to such movements is they sought to crush it. And that is when they launched. So this is Jarnail Singh Bindranwale is the leader of this movement and he is a Sikh itinerant preacher himself uh, doesn't cut his hair, or his beard, because that's the sign of being an Amritdhari orthodox Sikh, right? Uh, and eventually the Indian government is going to, as I said, move into the Golden Temple where he was holed up. So there's a gun battle that takes place over several days. Eventually his dead body is going to be taken out of there. Um, and then five months later, Mrs. Gandhi is going to be shot dead.
right? Now, we haven't finished with it, but time's up. Um, so I'm going to continue with this. We are really a bit behind, but as I said, we'll catch up, you know. Okay, so next week, however, for Thursday, second half, we will definitely move into economics, the question of development and the, the economic aspects of uh, development.